You're listening to the Business Club for Grown-Ups podcast with Jessica Fernley. Hi everyone and welcome to today's episode of the Business Club for Grown-Ups podcast with me, Jessica Fernley. Now today I'm joined by a very special guest, Laura Robinson. Now Laura is a qualified digital copywriter who helps other business owners gain confidence and style when writing their own online content. Laura, hello, it's brilliant to have you with us today. Hi, thanks for having me. Is there anything you'd like to add to that introduction that I've just done in terms of who you are, um, what's your family situation, where are you in the world, that kind of thing? Well, I am in East Anglia, one mile from the beach. So if anyone looks at my Facebook page or my Instagram account, you'll basically just see photographs of the same stretch of beach over and over again, because that's what we most like to do. I've got two boys at home, 11 and 13, and I home ed them alongside running my business. So that has been an interesting adventure. We've only been doing that for just over a year. And so far, so good. And it means that we get a lot more beach time. Amazing. So that's working well. And that's a funny setup, isn't it, in a way, because we were saying just now most of us sort of live for the term time because someone takes the children away so that we can actually get on and do our businesses. But you have the opposite set. Well, you, you don't really have any time where they're taken away. They're at home with you 100% of the time. They are at home almost 100% of the time. And that, in that first year, while they were kind of in the recovery phase from school, we didn't get them out much. They're just starting to be a bit more flexible about going out and visiting friends and going out with family. So I'm getting a bit of that time back. But yeah, I've had to be very creative about how I use my time and very productive with the time that I have available. And how much time do you have for your business? on a day-to-day or week-to-week basis how many hours do you think you work relative to what you're doing with homeschooling during the day during the week towards the end of the day their friends will get home from school about half past three in the afternoon and they're all on like playstation network or discord or all the other gaming sites are so as soon as their friends from home are home from school they just plug straight into that and they don't want to know me until like I say dinner is ready and then they'll come downstairs to eat so that gives me a good two to three hours each day where I can just concentrate on what I need to get done in that time I focus like on client work or stuff for my VIPs that stuff that needs to be done in a timely manner throughout the week and then at the weekend my husband takes over he like he has to do most of the housework at the weekend because it doesn't get done during the week and all the laundry and stuff and looks after the kids and I go out into my office in the garden we call it the shop office because it's a shed office and then um, get a good chunk of work done there however long I need to really usually a couple of goes at six hours at a time so yeah. that's when I do all of their stuff like write new training courses prepare my marketing material write blog posts the stuff that you need to do to keep the business going that sounds excellent because I was thinking as you said that wow two to three hours a day is not loads because I only work kind of uh, well, six hours in theory, because I do like a school length day. But then once you've taken off time for drop off in the morning and then the end of the day, I, I sort of have to finish work by about 2.30, 2.40. So sometimes I look at my week and I'm like, it's only really four hour day, isn't it? Once you've sort of adjusted for all the faffing around that I need to do. But yeah, it's amazing what we can get done, isn't it? In not conventional hours. Oh, definitely. And our lives are structured in a different way so that I don't have that stress and pressure of the mor- morning school run. Like I used to do it would take me like nearly two hours just to get them out of bed, get ready for school, get one to school. The older one would usually miss his bus because he didn't really want to be going to school. So I'd have to get him in. And by the time I got home from all of that, sat down and thought, oh, I'm going to have some breakfast now. <laughs> I would have lost like the first hour of my child free time just recovering from what had happened that morning. And then as the clock ticks nearer to three o'clock, the anxiety would start to build up as to what I would be facing when they came home. Um, so it, school wasn't a typical experience for my boys. I know that not everybody has that same level of stress associated with school hours, but they found it really difficult. And it was so disruptive to our lives that actually having taken them out and having them at home, because that stress has gone away, I don't feel like I'm down any hours or that it's any harder than it was before. In fact, it probably feels easier than it was before. Yeah, because you're almost not having to put them in a box with going to school that they're just they're not really wanting to be in yeah and so our lives are really flexible like I was just saying before we started at 5 a.m this morning my 13 year old is waking me up he'd been awake all night so that he could see the wolf blood super moon I think that's the right way of saying it because it was <laughs> the last time in 10 years so at 4 5 a.m this morning I was outside in my garden in my pink fluffy onesie 
staring at the lunar eclipse with him and now he's asleep because he's been awake all night and we wouldn't have been able to do that if I had a regular job and he had school so it's Mm. fun to make the most of the flexibility that we've got. That's amazing and I have to say I really agree like I I really like having a non-conventional working week and yeah so the school run does create a certain structure but I just I love that I'm doing different things in days of the week I love that I get to work from home I think for some people it just it really works doesn't it like not going to an office or not going to a place of work not having to be there Monday to Friday not having to do the hours unless it makes sense to do the hours if you can be really focused so that you use your time wisely and that time is used productively I think it makes a massive difference when I was working around school hours I was still stuck very much in employee mentality So, you know, you turn up for work and you're going to be there for seven hours and you're going to get paid whether you do the work or not, even though that was no longer the case. I wasn't going to get paid if I didn't get the work done, but I was still looking at like, how can I make this expand to fill the hours that I've got available and it would be very plodding and take me a long time. And now I've got that flexibility to use the time as I want to. I'm very productive because I want to get it done because in the summer I want to get to the beach (laughs) and in the winter I want to get back under a blanket and start reading a book so it's definitely made me more productive having that flexibility of time definitely and I'm interested in sort of where this lifestyle for you came from originally so have you always worked for yourself have you always had your own business from the time that you were sort of out of school university no I was 100% corporate ladder climber like this was my life it was I was going to get right to the top and make all this money and be this amazing financial services whiz kid um I did a business management degree and then I went straight into a graduate training program at a financial services company and I finished it early and I was like the youngest manager level employee that ever had because I was just like come on let's do this let's go on um and I had my first child and as soon as he could get he was six months old I was like get him into nursery I'm going back to work like full time um I mean partly that's because we needed the money for a mortgage so that I could buy a house but um I was also really keen to get back to work it was what I enjoyed and I didn't find the baby stage particularly enjoyable so I was happy to go back to work and then when I had my second son here they were only 21 months apart they're pretty close together the plan was to continue that he would also go to nursery and I would go back to work full time and I would still be this like all singing, all dancing employee of the month while having two small children. And um, it's like no word, like my life just fell apart. It, over the space of about a year, my mum was diagnosed with cancer at the same time her mother was in a hospice dying from it. Like they were literally a mile or so apart, one in the hospice, one in the hospital. And my own baby was bouncing in and out of hospital because he had a medical condition that meant every time he got even like a basic cold, I'd have to take him to hospital because he had no way of recovering from it himself. So my life was just spent driving backwards and forwards to hospitals. So I made a promise to myself that I'd find a way to get out of that by the time he was two because it was so stressful and I hadn't. So I basically just didn't go back to work one day. I took two weeks worth of holiday to try and figure out the situation and then I just didn't go back because I couldn't I couldn't think of a way forward. I had no one to help look after the kids because all my support network was looking after the rest of my family. Mm. So it wasn't this courageous story where I decide, oh, I'm going to be self-employed and I'm going to make it work no matter what. I just this, I just couldn't carry on working. And I took a year off where I like, gave myself a year to figure out how I was going to make money being self-employed, working online. And I did. And then I did. And that was always been my goal is if I can make this much, I don't have to go back to work and then like keep pushing it and pushing it. And so that I've never, it's been nearly 10 years, it'll be 10 years in March and I haven't had to go back to work. That's amazing. So almost like it was just a really hard situation. I mean, that sounds intense, just in a way that lots of us have not experienced to have so much kind of chaos going on in your family. And yeah, that puts enough strain on anyway but then sort of looking after an ill baby you know I've I've not done a lot of stints in hospital with either of mine but I had one um in the autumn in 2018 and it was only two days but it just it took me a long time to just recover emotionally from just like the immense stress like everything in your life has to just fall away doesn't it you know they don't provide you with a bed or with food you have to be there with your little one but I remember saying to um the people in A&E but I've got 15 people coming around for dinner today and they were like you got to cancel that. <laughs> and it's, it's the most stupid thing to say, but I was just like, but this wasn't in my plan. We're not supposed to yeah. do this. I've got to do. It doesn't happen to many people. So I think 
it's really hard for other people to understand because I think, yeah, my baby gets poorly too. And you're like, not like this, they don't. And the first time it happened, he was and he was five weeks old and he was admitted for five days. And I remember a really lovely person came and another parent showed me all around the ward. We were really lucky. They have pull down beds. So they showed me how we make you pull down bed up. And this is the kitchen. This is where you can keep the food. And this is where you can go and get food. And I remember thinking, oh, I don't want to be that person that knows this ward so well that their job is to volunteer and help the other parents. And then about six months later, there I am volunteering, helping around another parent, showing them how it all works. But it was difficult at the time, but I wouldn't it literally completely changed my life because I would I don't think I would have had the courage to say I don't want this corporate life I don't want this career I I had had that so programmed into me from even primary school that that's what was going to happen that it took something fairly significant to nudge me off of those rails and I am in awe of all the people that quit their job like intentionally quit their job and say oh, I've got it quite good but I know I can have it better and I'm going to go for it and work for myself that is another level of bravery because you know it's not brave to that was the only course of action available to me I couldn't have done anything else there's no way I could have functioned and held down a job and eventually I guess I would have been fired because I just couldn't keep coming to work so that was nothing brave about that that was like survival but when I see people who genuinely make the choice to jack in what they've already got and make a go of it that's to me that's real courage I really relate to that because I had a similar experience in that like I didn't really plan to stop my job it's just that my health issues which I'd sort of been trying to ignore they just got worse and worse and worse to the point that I literally physically could not get out of bed one day and then that started a whole chain of events you know it was so obvious looking back I was not really made for nine to five it doesn't suit me as a person I didn't like it very much actually like I love the work but I hated the environment and going you know commuting to an office in London that is just not me at all I needed the, the the circumstances at the time to make that choice for me. I don't think I ever would have said, oh yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop my career job. I just, I won't do that anymore. I don't think it's any less difficult though, is it? Because it's almost like, but I, I want to do this, but then I just can't. It's, it's not an option. Like when it gets taken off the table in some ways, that's very hard. But I guess in some ways it does, like you say, it does make it easier because you're just like, well, I have one option right now and that is not to do this job. So that's that. I mean, how did you feel about that whole saying goodbye to your corporate self and your corporate life because it sounded like you were really thriving at it and really going great guns with it was that a hard transition or what did the drama of everything going on just mean you didn't really have time to really process that I think I just never really processed it I really enjoyed my job and when I was in at work I was in communication so it's not miles away from what I do now although the circumstances are very different because it was very stiff and corporate and I mean, it was financial services so it's quite dull but I really enjoyed it and so it was hard to let go of that side of things and also I was someone other than just like this boy's mum you know I was like an actual person people at my work had known me before I had children whereas where I live most people only know me through them so it was I completely lost that side of my identity but at the same time there was so much going on I don't think I really process that at all and even now it's been 10 years and sometimes I see the building I feel like I could probably just walk in there and you know like get my old pass out and it would all look exactly the same and nothing's really changed but I didn't I didn't really feel that sad to be gone I think like for you I didn't realize that I wasn't suited for that lifestyle until I stepped out of it I remember when I was at university so this is wow it's like nearly 20 years ago now so it's quite a long time ago and um one of our lecturers was talking about this what the future of work would look like and now that we had this thing called the internet how this was going to change work and she painted this picture about people who would they were going to work from home and they were going to create this whole new economy of micro businesses where they worked via the internet and they didn't have an employer and they controlled what they did and I remember like that one lecture I remember that so clearly going yeah I want a piece of that that sounds fantastic and then I just kind of forgot about it and got back on the treadmill or, you know, back on the planned journey that I was supposed to be doing. And it was only when I left my job, I remember that thinking, I need, I, I know that this is possible. I've heard that people do it. I know this is a real thing and I need to find out more about it and how I can get involved. What did you do next? Did you have sort of a period where you're like, I'll oh, just let all the pieces fall where they fall? Or did this idea for a business then start to kind of come together quite quickly from that point? No, I had no idea, like no clue at all. 
I just kept reading whatever I could find on internet forums where people like the same kind of thread over and over again. I need to make like this much money a month. I don't want a job. What can I do? So I just look at all of the different things that are available. I looked at what I found really helpful was people per hour. I think it's called Upwork now, but those freelancing sites where people post for jobs for a certain amount of money. I went through people's profiles on there where they'd said what they could do. And I was thinking, yeah, I could like I could do that too, or I could learn how to do that. So I looked at what paid well and what people did on there and thought, yes, I'm gonna learn how to make WordPress websites. <laughs> so I learned how to build it with agony. Like I only had there was not proper training out then, it was just like whatever you could get for free off of YouTube. And I remember sitting at my desk and the first time I managed to type out in HTML the right string of code to make a link work and I was like oh, this is amazing I'm learning how to do this and um, so yeah, that was a real labor of love that took me a long time and so for a little while I did uh, like WordPress sites for friends and family and I also ran a toy blog and that meant that I got to go to toy fair in London at the start of it's round about now actually it's at the end of January where they showcase all the up and coming toys for the rest of the year so I was there one year and I got chatting to these guys who had a web design stall. So they were there to showcase to get businesses to work with them. And I was chatting to them about right, the content because I people were coming to me for websites. But I was finding that I was having to write the words to go on it too. So I was asking them what they did about that solution. And they said, well, whoever in the office doesn't have lots of websites to code, we just get them to write it. And I thought, this doesn't <laughs> sound like a good use of a website coder's time, to be honest, to be writing your content. And that's how I got into writing website content, because I enjoyed that way more than the creating the website side of things. So I started freelancing, writing website content for web design agencies. So they find the clients and then they just tell me what content they needed. They outsourced it to me. I had no contact with the client. I think most of the time the client didn't even know I existed. Because that was just way too complicated to explain that website designers do not write your content for you. Mm. So I was kind of hidden. And I think at the time I was really, I mean, I was still quite shy and nervous about this freelance lark. So that worked for me that I had minimal contact with clients. I just worked with these same kind of group of guys and did whatever they told me each week. And they paid me. So it, it was very similar to having a job, but I didn't have to go to the office, which was nice. How did you know how to like get those contacts? Did it all come from the people that you met at the fair? Like, how did you work for agencies? I googled. You googled. I googled. <laughs> Amazing. But I googled phrases like website content creator needed, writers needed, anything that I could find like that, and I found a couple of agencies. I found one that was a job on one of those freelance sites, and I did that gig, and then he then wanted to keep me on on a long-term basis so we like left the site and did it as a private arrangement through his agency and then and that was a big London agency and they mostly worked with office lets so there's fairly limited words that you can say that are different about here's some empty carpeted space in the middle of London come and work in it and um, so that's quite boring and there was another agency that was way more interesting and they tended to work with like new concepts and startups. So sometimes I get Kickstarter pages that I had to write for that or retailers. So it was mostly through those two agencies that I, yeah, I just found by Googling like crazy. Excellent. So this is what I'm really interested in because I feel like for you now, like copywriting is something that you are so good at and that, you know, your business is all based around the fact that you you are very good at writing, particularly sort of sales copy, persuasive copy. At this point, is that something that you knew that you were good at? I Yeah, I wouldn't have started doing it if I didn't. I already really enjoyed it. In my old job, I was writing um, corporate communications. They were internal communications. So the company had three to 5,000 people, depending on which wave of redundancy we were on, because we kind of went backwards and forwards. So my job was to write communications to an uh, employee level that kind of explained from the CEO's perspective or you know the board level this is what we're planning on doing this is what's going to happen so they would give it to me in their CEO speak that made sense to them and then I would need to write it in a way that the rest of the world would understand so I already knew I had like a bit of a knack for that that I don't I don't know how I ended up in that I was in mark I was in the marketing department and then I could have moved over and was doing some communications and I'd always like that kind of thing and then I did with the Institute of Digital 
marketing is that what IDM stands for I should know really (laughs) Um, (laughs) when I first started freelancing I did a direct and digital marketing qualification with them because even though I had a business degree it was already getting old and dusty and really pretty irrelevant to the world how it is now so I thought I'd better do something to update myself and that was it was fairly broad it covered like search advertising search engine marketing that type of thing from that I could get a feel for which parts were most interesting to me and it was still the writing and um, writing SEO content I didn't mind doing that either so I did a fair bit of that through the agencies too. When you got to that point working for the agencies and it's a white label service effectively isn't it so yeah the client doesn't know who you are what got you to the point where you were ready for the next step or something different what stopped you doing that forever I kept getting really great feedback which was nice so even though the client didn't have direct contact with me the agencies were passed on what they'd said which was really lovely and some of it was very encouraging and made me realize that probably I wasn't getting paid a fair amount compared to the difference that I was making to the project but also I didn't have any control over the type of clients that I was working with so I just had to take whoever the digital agency took and their target clients were very different from the people that I would most like to work with and um, we had one really huge project which was mostly about SEO content writing for a damp proofing company in Ooh. I don't know like in some suburb just outside London I'm getting and excited just thinking it about it. <laughs> I, know, I know so much about damp proofing. This was about eight years ago and I can still look at a damp patch and I know what that is and where it's come from. So I'd written, I don't know, like 20 blog posts that were all different. They were all about different case studies, real life case studies about damp proofing so that we could get the damp proofing problem plus the name of different locations onto the blog to rank them for in the search engines. And I was very grateful when the job was done. And it did pay well because it was a lot of content. And it wasn't actually that hard because, you know, like once you've seen one damp patch, you've seen them all. So I didn't have to do a massive (laughs) amount of research to be able to write the blog posts either. And then I got paid and then the agency got back to me and they were so excited. And they in this email, they said, it's great news that the company loved the website that we did so much. They want us to do individual websites for the whole franchise. So we'll be doing another nine of those. And I was like, no, we won't. I'm definitely not doing that. (laughs) then it was time for me to find something else to do and um, I thought I needed to get control over who the clients are so that's when I set up Worditude so that I had like my own website my own brand it was a limited company and that I could start marketing myself so that I would attract the right people that I wanted to work with I would say that was in a lot of ways scarier than leaving my job because for a long time people didn't really know what I did And then I was just like, here I am, I'm doing this and please someone come and work with me. Yeah, sort of with because you've been almost sort of hiding behind the agencies and then suddenly you're out there with your own brand and it's all about kind of your relationships. And it it, it feels more visible, doesn't it? Even though I think to, you know, people walking down the street, I often think this about myself, actually. I wonder if some of the um, other school mums think that I'm unemployed or sometimes even homeless because I wear like really relaxed clothes you know that lounge wear you know I, I'm the mum who probably needs to be like don't wear your slippers today that's not a good <laughs> and I think why do I do that because you know I'm, I'm a decent human being but at the same time I just I, I like to have work is almost quite separate from my day-to-day life and we can feel so visible when we put up a website and yet someone can look at us and just not even know that we have a website or a business or anything it's funny how that can really feel like a really vulnerable step almost it was so scary I remember thinking like what if people from my old job see me what if they comment what if they get in touch because I'd really left it behind then I was like I just want to close that chapter in my life and not go back there I definitely look like the unemployed mum. I got volunteered for everything, like every fate, every school disco. They'd say, oh, go and ask Laura if she could do it. I think, no, because Laura works. <laughs> this is not. Yeah. Just because I'm here for every drop-off and every pickup doesn't mean that I then go home and get to go and watch like X Factor reruns for the rest of the day. I am working while the kids aren't here. The best one that's happened to me is that someone asked if I wanted to be their childminder. And I was like... I don't want to be a childminder. I have a childminder. Like I I don't have free time, you know, and it's this kind of, it doesn't really matter at all, does it? And I think that's been a really helpful lesson for me just to be like, people can think whatever and it doesn't validate or not validate anything about my life. But it's just when you're like, do you think that I just sit at home reading magazines all day? It's it's funny, isn't it? I guess it's because we're in this sort of new category of mums who 
we, we don't let work dominate. We don't have the work schedule. We might even have the school schedule or for you right now, you have like the homeschool thing. You're completely writing yourself, but it's a different thing, isn't it? And people don't really know what box to put us in, I guess. People's guesses are so wildly out. It's hilarious. I've had um, in the last, so not this summer gone, but the summer before, my husband got made redundant from his job. We had the option to go up to another level or be made redundant. He's like, to be honest, I don't want the stress or the hassle. I was like, fine, just take the redundancy money, have the summer off. We live by a beach. Why would this not be fun? Um, And it was great for me because he looked after the kids all summer while I was working. And because we were doing that, I wanted to have a separate office because I'd been happy working at the kitchen table, but it wasn't going to be fair on them to be having their summer holidays with me going like, shh, quiet, I'm trying to work. We use some of the redundancy money to buy my shop office and have it put up outside. Well, I don't know what happened, but to the rest of the world, that was some kind of indicator that I had become an internet millionaire. And I had, re- <laughs> I had retired my husband and was going to live this amazing life. And my family, my friends, friends and family I definitely didn't say anything like that but that is the assumption that they made and towards the end of the summer when Dan started looking for work again they were so shocked they were like oh didn't it work out we thought that was it that he wasn't going to work anymore like, no he was having like eight weeks off not <laughs> not retired forever he doesn't want to retire but I think that's been really helpful to be the other so I've had all those years of people thinking oh like bless her she's a doesn't have to work how lovely for her and the husband looks after her to be being completely the other way to oh her husband gets to retire in his 40s and she's going to take care of everything and now they've got this office she must be an internet millionaire I think having <laughs> I seen like, both sides of it I can see that people are just way off like they don't have very much evidence to go on they're not trying to make judgments or assumptions but people like to know where you are don't they and so they just yeah. go with evidence they can see and they make a best guess and they're very often way off and for me the moral of that story is I'm probably way off about most of the best guesses I'm making about other people too and it's definitely easier now I think because we've had the two sides of it it's much easier for me to let go of whatever people's guesses about me because really it could be anything but no having my lovely shoppers outside and letting my husband look after the kids for the summer did not mean that I was suddenly an internet millionaire and I had retired my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. And I think that is an, a really interesting thing though, isn't it? Because when you first start your business, I've, I've had a lot of this of like, oh, your little business. So how's your little business going? <laughs> We've always been able to do our finances, you know, fairly comfortably. My husband is not in a well-paid job, particularly he's a church minister. So, you know, poor as church mice, but we haven't really had to go without stuff. And that's not really been because my business has been doing so well for the whole time it's been going but at the same time I think people do assume oh if if you don't have to have a paid job if you can set up a business because that's like a little hobby it's a silly little business isn't Uh really it's not doing anything Um, you can feel quite belittled in those early days and then I think I've had this with my family that suddenly they're like oh so how's it how's it going and you kind of talk about what you're doing and there's definitely been a shift in terms of now they they see it as like something serious but I agree I think they sort of slightly overinflate it and it's like we just just got to calm down but then I think it's difficult for people because it's not visible it's not like you've got like a big office that says Laura on you know on the top or whatever it's not something that is easily quantifiable and I don't know it's just it's something completely different to what people are doing in their own lives isn't it people say to me quite often you know what do you do and I say I'm a business coach and they're like what is that? It's not a job that they've heard of, even though I feel like it's really commonplace online. But then often they say, I I could never do that. And I just think, well, why? Because it's awesome. But we have jobs that and and work that we've built around our own skills and availability. And it's all sort of dictated by us in a way that is not normal, because normally a company advertises a job and you decide if you can squeeze yourself into that little box. And that's not to do it down at all. I think what I love actually is that so many of us can choose the circumstances that we do life by. I think that's so empowering that actually some people, they want to have that regular paycheck. They want to have a workplace where they see people. I'm an introvert. I don't like seeing people. I like being at home. <laughs> my, my husband chose to go back to work full time. Like it was, we had a, you know different options available because if he was home, I could work more. So like you, we're not like running around covered in cash, but we've got a bit of flexibility about who does what and how much we have to work. And he, you know, really thought about it and he really enjoyed being at home for that summer because it was going to be for a definite amount of time, but then said, 
tonight. I'd, ra- I'd rather go back to work and I would rather it was full time. I like the consistency of knowing what I'm doing each day. I like I'll get to do it every day for five days and then have two days off. And that is to me, that's like my idea of hell. But he he really enjoys it. So mm. work is for some people and or jobs are for some people and not for others. Mm, absolutely and I think it's it's funny isn't it the thing about retiring your husband because it's almost part of the like manifesto of all online entrepreneurs it's like right first of all I want to earn six figures then I want to retire my husband then I want to go and live in Bali or just move around and live in a camper van and if you have my children you would not want to go near a camper van I just have to say that straight away but um, I think it's really important that we don't I don't think I would want to retire my husband because actually he loves his job he loves his work and yeah it does set a lot of the sort of agenda for where we are in the country and what we're doing but that's his dream and that's the thing that he loves so if I retired him and took that away from him I just I don't think that would be the thing so I always think that it's really important that we have our own definition of our success and the lifestyle that we want to have it's not all about Ferraris and mansions in my house that isn't really what floats our boat at all but it's always about setting that vision yourself and I I also want to circle back a little bit to what you were saying before Laura about when you got to that point where you're like I'm ready to put my name on the website on the door how did you know because I know there are people listening to the podcast who are in that situation of like you know I'm I'm doing this for other people what if I could do it for myself that sounds scary how do I define that how did you know what service you wanted to offer and to who was that an easy process did it just fall into place I was just offered the same stuff as I was doing for freelancing and I, I like I did it all wrong. So I offered it as an hourly rate, like I'll do this. No. And then, <laughs> like, it was so to start off with, this website was really like begging people, like I'm this much per hour and I can I can write this, this, you know, and the length of the list was ridiculous, all the different things that I would do. And then I kind of plodded along like that for a little while. And then I worked with a business coach who sort of, who she ended up being my friend first, Nadia Finer. She came and talked to me at a Christmas party, like a business Christmas party. And she's like, I really think I can help you. And I was like, how do I, if I, can, I do not need help. I can do everything on my own. <laughs> I have but to I was, say, I, I dread saying that to people because sometimes you're like, I really want to give them a piece of sage wisdom. But then you, you really have to have the relationship there. But tell us what happened next. So, well, I hadn't ever met her before. There was no existing relationship at that point. And I don't, I wasn't rude, but I kind of gave the impression of like, no, I'm fine. But we, we got on and had like a nice friendly afternoon after that. Then we ended up being friends. And then eventually I like capitulated and went okay then I can't carry on like this but actually I it was because I got to the point where I was making I was making quite a lot of money I was back to what I was earning when I was in my full-time job mm. but I was very tired <laughs> and, yeah. I, and, and like had no structure I was really burnt out I was rubbish at getting invoices out I wasn't taking any deposits so obviously the first time that someone does not come up with the money after you've come up with the goods first time that happened you think oh I really need some processes in place to stop this from happening again yeah. so I worked with her to package things up and really that was the first time I thought about how I could do it the way I wanted to do it like I yeah. thought well I really like, like writing sales pages and about pages and I do think that they're the two most important pages on a website so I built packages around that uh, that made a huge difference it made it much easier to get quotes out the door to get invoices written up to have sales calls I think I might have started being brave enough to have sales calls at that point I was about a year in and I still hadn't spoken to anyone on video chat <laughs> was it all kind of emails and anything that doesn't involve your face or speaking yeah I didn't want to actually have to speak out loud I was really struggling to the idea of being on a zoom chat terrified me yeah is that something was... that you had in your corporate job or is that something that start that you felt aware of after you've been out of corporate and sort of doing your own thing and being a mom and that kind of thing um never had to do video chats in my old job I was I'd do a lot of meetings and speaking to people face to face that didn't bother me at all and a lot of phone calls it was often that people were phoning me and I I think because it was about my area of expertise and I had a job title you know I had a job title that said that they paid me a good amount of money they gave me a mobile phone they invited me to the meetings because they wanted my input on it there were a lot of indicators there that you know we like you you're good at your job we value your input so I didn't feel insecure there ever I felt like okay I know what I'm doing and you wouldn't be calling me if you if you didn't need what I have to offer it was very different being on my own although I felt confident about the writing and I think I still come across a lot better written than I do when I'm trying to speak because I get all jumbled up I'm a slow processor like a slow verbal processor so it works better for me to write things out than it does to speak so I was very much staying 
where I was comfortable with writing these emails. And I was really nervous that people would read my emails and my website content and then they would speak to me and go, oh, like, you're not as funny in person or like, <laughs> this is not as entertaining as when I read your blog post. It's funny though, these things that we tell ourselves, because I think everyone has got those insecurities or those things that they're, they fear doing, you know, I'm sure people listen to this, you can just think straight away, oh, just don't ask me to do Facebook Live or don't ask me to go and stand up in front of people, whatever it is, it might not even be about speaking, but there are things that we just dread doing. And we have a strong narrative often behind why we don't want to do that, don't we? And if you just do it, then it's fine. I had to get over my fear very rapidly because I went to, um, it was Denise Duffield Thomas talk a couple of years ago in London and she was doing a tour and a few of us went there while I was in the line. Like I was on my own, not with any of my friends. I was in the line to hand a ticket in and be told where you've got to go. And someone, I didn't know this person at all, but they recognized me and then, and they asked you know are you Laura from that where did you blog I love reading your blog and I was like oh, I don't know what to say I want you to hyperventilate <laughs> on the spot it was the first time it ever happened like ever nobody knows who I am I, I know I do ask for it by having pink hair it doesn't you know help me blend into the background but that had never happened before and I didn't know what to do I could hardly breathe and I kind of mumbled through the conversation. And then I thought, actually, I need to do more stuff like where I talk on podcasts or Facebook Live so that if anyone ever meets me in person, they're not bitterly disappointed. They do at least <laughs> have some idea of what I sound like. <laughs> but I think it's, it's true, though, isn't it, that often if you get thrown into a situation where you have to do it, you're like, oh, you either think that wasn't so bad or you think I could do better in this area. And it sort of lights that fire of like, what are safe ways, what are good steps that I can take to actually put myself in this situation so I just really get to a point where I can cope with it a lot better and I I have like a sort of output that I'm happy with yeah I found with video it was much easier to do things like this, where people ask me questions and I just have to respond because <laughs> it's quick I don't have to overthink it very much I don't have to prepare so I don't then spend like a whole day worrying that what I've prepared is rubbish and a complete waste of time mm. so I've, and I knew that of myself because when I was in my job I worked I did fine with phone calls because people would ring me up and I'd answer their questions so knowing that about myself that I don't mind being spontaneous and answering questions i said yes to those kind of interviews first so that I could get practice at it and feel more confident in front of the camera but if you prefer to prepare things then yeah don't be saying yes to interviews first maybe say yes to hosting a masterclass so you get a chance to prep it first yeah no that's that's really good advice and you've been doing what you've been doing in some form for like a decade probably slightly longer now um for people listening who are in those early stages or even they're in a job and they're thinking this isn't really going the way I want it to. And what if there was another way? What if I could do something differently? What would your advice be to them? For a long time, even when I was in work, in my job, I was really good at wiggling my way into work that I was interested in. So I liked writing and I liked communications. Uh, so whenever an opportunity to do, like to be seconded onto a project, to do that even for a short period of time, or obviously the jobs I went for were in that line of work. So I was always kind of nudging myself in this direction, um, not knowing that I'd end up being self-employed, but n- knowing that I enjoyed that type of work. So wherever possible, just try and get that kind of experience. Because even if you leave and become self-employed, the skills that you learn in your job are going to come with you. So that's handy. And I just found it helpful to be really open to what other people are doing. Just keep like nosing around in other people's businesses and see what they offer and how they package it up and how they price it. And since I've been doing like this work, I have worked with hundreds and hundreds of businesses now. And I used, you'd have a conversation with someone and say, I do this. For example, I saw that, that was going around Facebook the other day that this woman who knits chickens dresses like that and diapers she makes chicken dresses and diapers that's her business that's now, like five years ago I would have just laughed that off and going don't be ridiculous nobody runs a business like that but I have seen businesses where in the first conversation I'm going you do what and then they run a really successful business because that's the thing it's not always about what the business does it's about what the need is and if they know that there's a market there and people I want to know who these I'm getting on Google afterwards because I want to know who these people are who want chicken dresses and diapers but at the same time if, if there's a need for that then that's a good business isn't it yeah and we're a big planet and most of us are now connected by the internet so just because nobody in your area needs what you offer but so what just go online there's going to be somebody that needs you so ideally if you can do it over video chat or put it in the post then you're going to be fine 
there's so much more opportunity out there than we realised. And, and that's, I had to do so much research. There was so much time went into just researching what was possible and how people got started and how they set it up. And all that time is unpaid. But that's why I gave myself that year to think, okay, I'm just, I'm not going to do anything for a year. I had a whole year where all I did was research how do people make money online because that's what I want to do. And I am not quitting. I'm going to keep going until I can find a way to make it work. And I did. And I still, every year, I'm like, I've, I've survived another year. <laughs> I don't have a job. <laughs> One thing that I'm aware of, the longer that my business goes on, so it's been four years now that since I set up my business, I don't know if I ever would have believed if, if the me of like five years ago or even the me of 10 years ago that I would create my business, that I would be actually able to make a decent living from what I'm doing and build something just from nothing. I, I Sometimes I just have that feeling of like, I can't quite believe that I've done that. It's amazing. I don't think the me of then would have believed it could even be possible. Do you, is that something you relate to as well when you look back and you just think if you could say to that person sort of 10 years ago, this is where you're going to end up? I don't know where I got my unwavering belief that I was going to make this happen from. But I had a, when I set up my business bank account, and you have to like have a phone for business the manager phones you back and they want to know a little bit about what you're going to do to check that I'm not laundering money or anything so I said well I'm going to write um I write website content for people so and you're like you do what so, well, when you see a website for business a designer has built the framework for the website but where do the words come from and he's like oh I didn't think about that I didn't I didn't think I was like oh, exactly nobody thinks about that I'm going to write the words and I work with agencies and they'll hire me to do that so there's some words to go on the website and then his next question was, and you think you're any good at that, do you? <laughs> well, I of confidence. Like, Brilliant. <laughs> Thanks. I'm so happy I chose to bank with you. This is the start I was really hoping for. But in some way, it was just so silly, like such a rude and stupid question to ask me that actually it kind of put fire in my belly. And I, and I still look at it. I do hope you can see what goes into that bank account now that you were like, oh, do you think you'll be any good at this? <laughs> but I, I guess again it's going back to what we we're saying isn't it that it's, it's a new category of businesses like these micro businesses if that's what you want to call them that didn't exist 20 years ago and I guess I feel very fortunate to be a woman at a time when actually we have these opportunities we can create something from nothing we can build a business and make it work around everything else that we're trying to do yeah I hadn't had the children so I wouldn't I would have found it much harder to say or oh, I'm going to take this time out and spend a year researching ways I might make money online. Like that would have would have looked like insanity. But to have two young kids at home and say, oh, I'm just going to take some time to be with the kids when actually what I was doing was spending every spare minute on my laptop trying to figure out how I was going to make this work. And a lot of mum points for doing the right thing and being home with my kids that I wouldn't have got away with if I'd been a man or didn't have children. So yeah, I've definitely benefited from from that. But also, once you've broken the, I said it's about how I chose to home ed, because it was not easy to just look at your friends and family who for their whole lifetimes have only ever known one way of raising children, which is they go to school full time, they take 10 GCSEs, they do A-levels, and then they may possibly leave and get a job. To stand up in front and go, yeah, we're not going to do that because we don't think it's going to work out for our kids. That's was quite terrifying but it's made so much easier by the number of times I've gone yeah I've left my job or um, no I'm never going back to work because I'm doing this instead or yeah I make money over the internet because people send it to me electronically over PayPal and like people my family look at me and they do what like how does it get to you how do people actually pay you <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing isn't it? once you've like really basically once you've really bitterly disappointed your loved ones once it becomes much easier to keep on doing it I, and so I would stand by that 100 percent. just disappoint them right from the word go because then everything is up from there absolutely but what's really funny is I bitterly disappointed them by going yeah I'm going straight back to work after I've had this baby because you know the baby's nice and all but I want to crack on with my career that was a big disappointment and then when I said yeah I'm leaving work and I'm going to be at home now also a big disappointment. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a lesson in there, isn't there, about, you know, the, the messages that we receive and maybe how seriously we should take them at all stages, because I think it is fairly universal, isn't it? Sometimes families, they don't really tell you what the plan is, but they're very good at telling you at every stage of your life that you're not really doing what you should be. <laughs> yeah, gone wrong. And they used to be like, a bit at school, and you'd watch those kids that just were like, they could not stop getting into trouble. Like, in the end, you feel a bit sorry for them, because they just could not stop breaking the rules. And you'd wonder like, 
why do you keep doing that? You know that you're going to get told off. And now I realize because the first time you've done it, you're like, well, we might as well just crack on now. And you just keep on doing what you want to do and pleasing yourself. Because once you've broken the norm, once you've got the courage to keep doing it to suit yourself after that. And I do think actually that is how essentially you win people's approval, not by trying to sense out what they want you to do and do that, but actually just find your own compass and say, this is the path that I'm on. They might not get it at first, but I really do think that once you're established on that path and once you're doing it with confidence and actually you're able to survive, you know, the world hasn't ended. That is literally where where all of the validation comes from. And by that point, you don't even need it, which is like a double win. So I, I really agree with that. If you can get through it, I think the, the problem is that at the time when you are most in need of someone to go, you know, you, you, you're really good at this, you can do this. The people around you who love you are not going to be able to do that because they're more scared than you are. So that's why it's really important to have some kind of business community around you so that, you know, I have a few really good online friends that I can message them and go, I am freaking out about this. And they'll just literally sit there for the evening, just message me back every now and then like, it will be fine. You know what you're doing. You've done this before. And there's no way I'd let on to someone in real life if I felt like that because they, they would just start to panic as well they don't have the inner resources to go and be reassuring because they're they're always on the edge of whether what I'm doing is acceptable I suppose so if I start to indicate that I'm a bit nervous about it too mm. that's it they've gone I need to to then always give them this this front of everything's fine and I can handle it and this is a yeah, slow exactly. decision I've made. And that That's what a good business support network does for you, really, isn't it? And that's a seamless link, isn't it? Because you've been my guest this month in my membership group, the Business Club for Grown Ups, which is my, my group for female entrepreneurs who are looking for that support with their business, who want to hear from experts like Laura and a ton of other people who come in every month to teach us the things that we really need to know in our business. Laura has done a fantastic masterclass for us all about how to launch a product or service in your business without a ton of stress. I found it so helpful. Um, Laura's helped me a lot with launching in my business. And we had a lot of fun doing it, didn't we, Laura, as well? So if um, you want to hear more about that, you can go to the Business Club for com and find out more about how to join. Now, Laura, if people have enjoyed hearing what you said, I've loved this. I could talk on all day, but we should stop soon for the sake of time. But how can people find out more about you and your business? Where's your online home? Go over to writewithwordatude.com and you'll find everything there. There's, there's a blog there that could definitely be better organized. that has got a ton of useful stuff in it. On my to-do list for the first quarter of this year is to make that a bit more organized. Jump in there. There's loads of um, resources. I've got a Facebook page uh, called Laura from Worditude, and I also have a free Facebook group. Put Worditude in the bar at Facebook. That will bring up everything you need to know. Fantastic. And we will put all those links in the show notes as well so people can find them. Laura, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for sharing your business story. I've really enjoyed hearing it. And for everyone listening, I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. You've been listening to the Business Club for Grown Ups podcast with Jessica Fernley. To find out more, visit the businessclubforgrownups.com.